Hi, welcome to today's lesson on counting significant figures. I am going to drop this question here for you. What is the difference between these two balances? The difference between the two balances is that one of them has a very high degree of precision. It measures to the thousandths place, and then the second one only measures to the whole number. In your kitchen, if you have a kitchen scale, you may have a um, balance or a scale that goes to the whole number in grams, and that usually is fine for a kitchen. In a chemistry lab, you usually want some decimal places, um, and the thousandths place really means that it's measuring individual milligrams. So this is a really, really good balance, probably a few hundred bucks, and this is probably like 15 or $20. <laughs> so um, big difference there, and this is because this has a higher degree of precision. So um, again, this balance has a high degree of precision and it goes out three decimal places. The number of the digits on your measurement are going to give some indication as to the precision of the tool. So if you have 1.000 grams, you know you're working with a really expensive tool um, versus a not so expensive tool. This is how scientists kind of communicate with each other without really saying like, hey, my tool's really precise. They will just record a measurement that has lots of decimal places and that does all of the talking for them. So this balance here is kind of different because it has less precision, it has decently low precision. And the thing here for science um, that makes this not such a great scale is that this one gram could have been 0 0.5 grams that got rounded up to one gram. Or it could be 1.49 grams that got rounded down to one gram. So the margin of error on this balance is a whole gram in either direction. It could be half, or not a whole gram, it's a whole gram total. It's half a gram down and half a gram up. Um, and that's your margin of error on this. So in a kitchen, probably not a big deal, but in a chemistry lab, this could be a pretty big deal. So this is why chemists oftentimes um, use more expensive scales than one that is just rounding to the whole number. In a kitchen though, it's totally cool. So now I'm gonna ask you, what is the difference between 2000 with a decimal and 2000 without a decimal? Take a second to pause and kind of ponder why one of these is better than the other or more precise than the other. I will tell you the 2000 with the decimal is more precise than without the decimal. The one with the decimal is saying that um, you're measuring exactly 2000, where the 2000 without a decimal is a number that was rounded to 2000. I actually wanted to show you very quickly. Um, I tried to do it, but I don't have a pen that's fine enough to do it. But I took my regular ruler, and this is something that you could maybe um, experiment with. Uh, so I took the ruler on the centimeter side, and I made three little rulers. <laughs> So the top one measures in decimeters, which is 10 centimeters, and the second one measures in centimeters, and then this bottom one, I tried to do millimeters, but again, my pen wasn't fine enough. So in that place, you could just use every graduation on the centimeter side of your ruler. You could take this around and try to measure stuff and see like how your level of precision increases with each new measurement. So if we just measure a post-it here, um, I want to say that on my decimeter scale, this yellow post-it is maybe 0.5. And that's as far as I can actually measure because this is measuring in decimeter, so I can only go one place more. Um, so I'm going to say that the post-it on the decimeter scale is 0 0.5. 0 0.5 decimeters. And on my centimeter scale, wow, would you look at that? <laughs> it's, I can promise you it's lined up correctly when I put it down on the table, but it actually is 0.5. But on that measurement scale, it would be 0 0.50 because I can add an extra um, decimal place there. So that's 0 0.50. And then 
again, I didn't have a pen fine enough to do it on the paper. So I'm just going to use the regular ruler for my millimeters. And actually, I'm going to pull just one of these so it's thinner so I can get real close to the measurement. Um, it's actually 0.51. So this is uh, 0.510. Oh, I've measured all of these in decimeters, actually. <laughs> all of my units are decimeters um, on my measurements. But you can see that my, my measurements became more precise, and they also um, became more accurate as I got a better scale to my ruler. So that's just a way that you could, you know, kind of practice and see the difference for yourself. But that's kind of what's going on here with this 2000 with a decimal and the 2000 without a decimal. So the weird thing here is the number zero. And this is where um, chemists can be kind of annoying for people who are learning it for the first time. But for those of us who have been doing science for a while, um, it, it kind of makes a lot of sense. So we know that zero, the number, has no value. It represents nothing. <laughs> um, it's really just a placeholder. So sometimes zero is saying, hey, I'm just holding the place here. And other times zero says, there's nothing that goes here. And it's a little strange to kind of understand the difference. But I need you to look at the numbers um, 100, 100 with a decimal, and 101. 100 with no decimal says I was rounded to 100. 100 with the decimal says I am exactly 100. The difference here is that these zeros are placeholders. They are pushing this one into the hundreds place. These zeros say there is no number for 10 and there's no number in the ones place. There are zero ones, there are zero tens, and there's one hundred. And then down here, the same thing is happening where um, we have one in the hundreds place, zero in the tens place. It's not saying I'm holding the place. This one says there are no tens. I know that it's like a really slight difference in what that means, but it is different. Um, so scientists have come up with a bunch of rules to tell us when zero is just pushing digits so that our numbers look correct, or when those zeros are indicating, hey, there's nothing in this spot. There's no value here. And again, I know that sounds really similar, but it is the teeniest, weeniest, slightest difference. So there's a bunch of rules for how this is done. And then there is kind of a trick that I'm going to teach you that I think is way better. <laughs> so the first rule is that all non-zero numbers are significant. They have real value. Of course, one means one, two means two. Those numbers have real value. That one's kind of straightforward. Um, the second one is that numbers in front of other numbers are called leading zeros. Leading zeros have no value. They are just placeholders. So if you think of those zeros in front of the three, those zeros are just pushing the three into place. So those have no value. They're just placeholders. They are not significant. Then we can have numbers behind other numbers, like 4,000 here or five. Both of those are examples of trailing zeros. So those trailing zeros count as placeholders when there's no decimal, like in 4,000, but they count as significant and important and having value zeros when there's a decimal written. So this 4,000 with no decimal says I was rounded to 4,000. And the five with a decimal says I am exactly five all the way to the hundreds, the thousandths place. I am five exactly to the thousandths place. That's very hard to say. Um, so those are very different types of measurements.
So again, the trailing zeros become behind other numbers and they are only significant when you have a decimal written. And then finally, you have numbers between non-zero numbers like um, 705. And 705, that zero is saying that it counts. It is a zero that has value to the measurement. It is not something that, it's not a zero that's a result of rounding. It's a zero that is indicative of having zero in the tens place. This just as easily could have been 706, 707, 708, 709, or 710. And that's why this zero is significant. That's why it counts. It gives real value to the measurement. That's what a significant figure is. They're sometimes called significant digits, but there's a much easier way to keep all of this straight, and I prefer this method. Um, so what you're going to do is anytime you're asked how many significant digits are in a measurement or how many significant figures are in a measurement, you are going to take that number and plop it inside of a map of America. And you are going to make assessments on that number using the Pacific and Atlantic side of the number. Okay, so if we wanted to find out how many significant figures were in 705, we would put 705 like in Kansas in the middle of America, and we would look at that number from either the Pacific side or the Atlantic side. So when the decimal is present, when the decimal is written, we are going to look at the Pacific side of the number, present Pacific, both start with P. Um, we are going to look for the first non-zero number and then we're gonna count everything that comes after it. So it's gonna look like this. We come in from the Pacific side, which is the left. We find the first non-zero number, which is the two. We're gonna count the two and everything that comes after it. And that is the number of significant figures we have. So in this case, 2000 with a decimal has four significant figures, the two and all of the threes. If you wanna go back to the original rules, these are trailing zeros with a decimal. So they're going to count, and the two counts because it's not zero. So that's four digits. It works. I will tell you the Pacific Atlantic rule has no exceptions. It works all the time. It's not like some of those other tricks that trick you into thinking that you can use the trick 100% of the time. This trick actually does work 100% of the time. Okay, so now 2,000 decimal absent. We are going to approach this number from the right side, the Atlantic side of the number, and we're going to find the first non-zero number. So we have to skip all of these zeros because they are not non-zero numbers. And we're going to find the two. From this direction, this tells us that we only have one significant figure. Only the two counts. So back to the original rules, this is 2,000 with trailing zeros but no decimals. So they don't count. Just the two counts. So we have one significant figure, one sig fig, one significant digit. Um, this is how we count significant figures in chemistry. I know it seems a little bit crazy. Um, so counting the number of significant figures or sig figs kind of like gives you a hint to the measurements that you have. The more significant figures you have, typically the more precise your measurements are. Really, Good, precise tools are going to have lots of significant figures in the measurements. And we oftentimes use this to measure like how good an experiment is. If it has not a lot of sig figs, it's usually not a very reliable experiment because there's a lot of rounding involved. And that is going to, over time, the more rounding you do, the more skewed your data comes out. Um, when we do experiments, we wanna make sure that they're as precise as possible. All right, let's find out how many significant figures are in each of these measurements. First up, we have 325. So 325, the decimal is absent, it's not written. So we're gonna come in from the Atlant Atlantic side and that first non-zero number is five. So I'm gonna count the five and everything that comes after it, meaning that 325 has three sig figs. Um, again, something to note, if you want to go back to those really boring original rules, these are all non-zero numbers. So every single one of them counts. Okay. Now the number 100 with a decimal, the decimal is present. So we're going to come in from the Pacific side 
And we're going to start at the first non-zero number and count everything that comes after it. So that is one, zero, and zero. This also has three sig figs. Everything counts. Okay, now we're looking at 100 without a decimal. The decimal is absent. So we are going to come in from the Atlantic side, skip over those zeros and start counting at the one, count the one and everything that comes after it, still moving to the left. And this is going to just be one sig fig. Okay, we have the number 402. 402, the decimal is absent. We're going to come in from the Atlantic side, start counting at the first non-zero number, and count everything that comes after it no matter what, and this will give us three sig figs. I'll give you a few more. All right, let's take a look at these and determine the number of significant figures in each of these measurements. So, in 0 0.04050, we have a present decimal, so we're going to come in from the Pacific side. We are going to look for the first non-zero number, which is 4. We're going to count the 4 and everything that comes after it. So, those all count. This gives us four sig figs. So I'm just going to write SF. Um, so back to the original rules. These are leading zeros that don't count. This is a sandwiched zero that does count. And this is a trailing zero that has a decimal. So it counts. You see how the Pacific Atlantic rule is so much better? Here we have four sig figs. Okay. Um, ooh, 0 0.002 has a decimal. It's present. So we're going to come in from the Pacific side, start counting at the first non-zero number, and we have just one sig fig. Only the two counts. The leading zeros do not count. Third one here, Decimal is present. We're going to come in from the Pacific side, skip over those first two zeros, count the seven and everything that comes after it. This gives us three sig figs. And last up, we have 1.005. Again, decimal is present. We're going to come in from the Pacific side, start counting that the first non-zero number, which is one, count it and everything that comes after it, giving us four sig figs. All right, so there you have an example of everything. You have trailing zeros, sandwich zeros, leading zeros. All of this with a lot of practice will get easier, I pinky promise. Um, again, the Pacific Atlantic rule will work all the time. There are no exceptions to that rule. So if you find that is easier to use than the four listed rules, it certainly is for me. Feel free to use that. It'll always work. Um, any questions you have, leave them in the comments below. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss tomorrow's lesson and I'll see you there. Bye.